now in Senate Government Operations on Tuesday, May 12th. And um, we're doing a couple things. We're gonna do a couple things that aren't exactly on the agenda today. Um, we had scheduled the, um, we're looking at kind of these three buckets, the transitioning to maybe more normal, the um, what we need to put in place so that we don't get caught like in such a uh, scurry again, if this happens again, and then things that we learned that could become permanent or that we could apply going forward. And um, today we're looking at those issues around elections, the military, and then we're going to look at uh, the charter change from Weathersfield. But we, and I also sent out a note to see if we could look at uh, H947, which it just passed the house and it was referred to us this morning. So I don't, we probably don't even really have it yet, but it is here and it is one of those COVID related things that um, should happen. And we'll talk about that later. And I don't know if it's Betsy or Tucker. I think it's Tucker that has that one because it's a municipal related issue. So let's let's start looking at the, is, does that, is that your understanding committee and everybody about what we're doing today? Okay, I don't hear any yes. dissents. So I guess everybody agrees. So let's start with um, looking at the elections. And I, what I would like to do actually is, since there still is this kind of hanging out their issue around the November election is uh, start with a, a little conversation about that and then kind of lesson we learned and how, how we're going to, <clears throat> I'm not sure that there's a, much of a transition to make around the elections. We do, but there might be some permanent changes that could be made. So I, I'll, just so that um, I shared an email with Chris and Secretary Condos and Will this morning. And I'm going to tell you what I said so that, because um, it's probably the wackiest idea ever, but I dreamt it. So I'm sure it's brilliant. So when I read the governor's letter, it seemed to me that the governor was saying, go ahead, get everything prepared, do it. And then in after, when the, pri the ballot, final ballots can't be printed until after the primary anyway, but everything else can be printed. All the envelopes, because we're gonna need those anyway. So get everything ready. And then in August, figure out, do we need to mail out ballots or not? And I would, urge us all to not talk about this as a vote by mail, because it's not a vote by mail. This is a mailing out the ballots. The, the voting can be done by mail or it can be done by going to the polls or anything else. And so if we say vote by mail, a lot of people out there are thinking, I won't be able to go to the, the, the polls. I have to vote by mail. And that isn't true. If, even if we mail out a ballot to everybody, that isn't the case. So I would urge us all to stop using vote by mail. So my thought in reading that letter was that he said, go ahead and get prepared, which in my mind means sign the contracts, get the mailing houses set up, buy the post, the indicias, print them on there, do everything, get everything ready. And <clears throat> in August, to get the contract signed for the mail houses, the printing, everything. In after the primary, if then the decision is made to mail them out, uh, and I may be all wrong here, but everything will be printed, and it can be, it can be mailed because it's all printed, and I suggested right after the primary sending out or, or printing before the primary, getting as part of the preparation, you're doing two postcards. One postcard would be a tear off postcard that goes to every 
registered voter that says uh, that's a tear off that you send in to ask for your ballot to be mailed to you. The other one is a postcard that's going to go to every single voter that says um, we're we're going to be mailing you a ballot and you can these this is what you can do with your ballot you can mail it back you can take it to the polls you can do whatever you want with it so have those two postcards prepared ready and ready to send out and then send one of them that that was my suggestion i i don't know that that would even work and i know that i haven't had a chance to even run this by will and will is the the brains behind this so I apologize for kind of just uh, springing this on us, but I do think that that is part of the preparation and that can happen. And then in August, um, the ballots are either sent out or people request them and they're all labeled and mailed and ready to go anyway. And the town, if, my, if I request one from my town clerk, my town clerk, can have them sent out from the Secretary of State's office. I, I mean, I don't know if that works or not, but anyway, that's my suggestion. And I'd like to hear from other people and what's going on. And I, I really think that the governor's letter just said, get everything ready. That's the way I read it. So, Will, Chris. Yes, yeah, Senator, thank you. Maybe I'll, I'll just start real quick. You want to say anything? Um, we should listen to Will on the... I'm sorry, can you hear me? This is Chris, can you hear me? Kind of. Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Senator. I thought maybe I would start really quickly here and um, Will Senning uh, can, of course, uh, chime in on some of the practical implications of of what you're suggesting, but just to, to back up a little bit and give everybody the background, we did propose a directive to Governor Scott that would um, allow us to do, a, to do for the primary, um, kind of the normal approach with a, a, a very ramped up uh, approach to voting by uh, mail through absentee ballot requests. And we would really pump that up. The primary is a, a different election. It's a not as well attended election. We think we can preserve the, the safety uh, of Vermont for the August primary, given the numbers and, and using the absentee ballot request system. For November, which is going to be a much heavier turnout, uh, our approach would be to mail a ballot to every registered voter, uh, every active registered voter, and um, give them that option of voting by mail or voting at polling places, meaning that polling places will still remain open. People can make their choice at that time. What the governor has said is that he doesn't want to make that decision right now. Uh, and he wants to make that decision after the August primary. And so we've responded back saying that puts us in a very difficult position. Um, and we're, we're um, waiting on a further response from the governor. We're hoping that we can work with governor to alleviate some of those concerns. Uh, but our focus, as it has been from the very beginning, and Secretary Kondo says this when he starts every one of these conversations, is we want to preserve every Vermonter's right to vote, and we want to protect the health and safety of voters, town clerks, and election workers. So that doesn't have to be a choice there between protecting your health and protecting your right to vote. Um, the governor has, uh, the governor and his health experts have said there's no way to predict what the status of the virus is going to be in November or even September or October. Um, and everyone is advising, a lot of the experts, the health experts, the federal experts, the state experts are advising there will be a resurgence. There's a very high likelihood of a resurgence in the fall. So we don't want to wait until August to make a decision. And as you said, Senator White, the governor has essentially said, we agree, you need to be planning. You need to be making the preparations but he still doesn't want to make that call right yet as to whether we have to have, um, uh, whether we should be mailing a ballot to every active registered voter in November. We already have deadlines that Will can talk to 
that you've heard before, I think um, we have deadlines to prepare, procure, and implement our contracts, our suppliers, our paper, our vendors, uh, our envelope printing contracts. All of that needs to happen this month for November. Yeah. Um, so we need some certainty. We've gotten some certainty out of the governor by saying he thinks we ought to do this, um, but he's also at the same time saying we could possibly change our minds in August. And that's a really difficult position for us to be in. So we've asked the governor to provide us with some additional information, um, how he thinks this information on the ground is going to change in August, what it gets by waiting until August. Um, we firmly believe that voters ought to have the power to decide how they exercise their right to vote in, no, in November, in September, October, November, and that we need to make that decision now so that we can start planning with the clerks, we can start communicating with the general public to alleviate any confusion so that we can get those contracts in place with certainty and put our team, teams to work. Um, so to some extent, I totally agree uh, with Senator White that the governor has given us the green light to proceed, um, but we still have that uncertainty lurking in the background with a decision uh, in August that could possibly pull that back on us and throw everything into turmoil. And Will can explain to you why it would be really problematic for him, for his team, for the vendors, for town clerks, if we reverse course uh, so late in the game, um, although we're um, proposing a, a potential offer for that with the governor and, and we're working on a compromise to help alleviate his concerns about making a decision too early. Um, I guess, you know, at this point, I would just turn it over to Will to talk about yep. some of the, um, the practical implications of not having a firm decision yet um, and proceeding as though we do. Um, and of course, he's the one who has to implement this with the town clerks, with all of the contracts and vendors that he's been working really hard on this for a couple of months already. Um, so I, I guess if it's all right with the chair, I'd, I'd turn it over to Will at this point. Yeah, that would, that would be fine. Thank you. Will? And I do apologize to you, Will, for not um, kind of running this by you first, but and just land, putting it in your lap right now. You're muted, you Will. Muted. Uh, You're muted. Madam Chair, hello. I'm checking in. Sorry, yes. I had a, something ran over and, and then I had a little trouble connecting. You'll be you'll be reassured to know you're not the only one who ever has connection problems. <laughs> yes, we I think all we had, all we had all problems had today. today. We all had problems connecting today. Yeah, and something ran over. You didn't run something over. Not that I'm when aware. When you said of. that, I thought maybe you ran over a skunk or something. Um, no, that was in uh, that was in caucus. I ran over a skunk. Not here. No. No problems. <laughs> okay. Will. <laughs> Will. Yes, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. I'm, yes. I'm, I have issues with the speakers on my laptop, so I'm doing the testimonies today through my iPhone. So we'll see how that goes, but so far, so good. Um, and Madam Chair, I appreciate that acknowledge, acknowledgement. Um, that sort of, I, I wasn't necessarily prepared for that hypothesis and scenario and responding to it. So, but I'm happy to, I understand <laughs> how times are right now, um, but just know that affects the quality of my answer in the moment, I guess is how I would put it, the thoroughness of my answer. Mm -hmm. but, um, um, pardon, me, pardon me for interrupting it. Let me just, can Madam Chair, can you restate the hypothesis or whatever this thing he's responding to so that his answer makes sense? I don't want to, sorry, I missed it. What's the question? So I, I last night In a nutshell. woke up, um, I just lost everybody. Okay, there, there you're yes, back. Yes, and, and Jeanette, except you had for Chris, problems, but. You had problems being frozen. What? You could, oh, you, for, I am first frozen? part of your describing. You had been uh, for the I first can't part you. of the meeting. You were, you were frozen. Uh, uh, well, I, I, you you guys keep 
Could we just let the chair Should go? Should I go up and come back? Huh? No. You're coming through fine. Well, should I go out and come back? Am I frozen now? You're fine now. Yeah. Nope, you're fine. You're fine now okay. for me. You're fine. Well, let me know. Can, let me know if if something happens and I can you because I can't tell. So, Chris Bray, what? What? Can you hear me? I did. Can you hear me? Is somebody saying Please, something? Please let the chair speak. Somebody keeps saying, "Can you?" Somebody keeps saying, "Can you hear me?" Me, I'm here. I'm curious if okay. my my audio and everything is. No, it keeps going in and out for me. So, can I? Can I restate it very briefly? So my understanding, Chris Bray, was that the governor's letter said, <clears throat> go ahead, do everything you need to do to make, this, to make this happen, except pull the trigger. That's the way I read it. Do all the printing, make all, do all the contracts, pay the contractors, get everything set, do everything. So I suggested that a, a kind of a compromise position might be then to, to also print two sets of postcards. One set of postcards would be, and, and they would go out after the primary. One set of postcards would be something with a tear off that said, send this in to request your ballot. The, the other set of postcards would be a postcard that says, we're going to mail everybody a ballot and here's what you can do with it. You can do one of these three things. And so my guess is that after the primary happens, the position is going to be that we cannot have a regular election. And so it's that, but we're prepared to do either, either one in that case. And I know that's, I just tossed this at Will and Chris this morning. So it isn't well thought out. And, and I do think that there is, um, I know there's people have talked about a, an education that needs to happen for voters. I don't think the general population pays any attention to the process of the general election until after the primary. So I think if we start talking about the two different systems before the primary, that it's going to be confusing for people and that, um, I mean, how many people do you know that worry about the general election until after the primary is open, over? And people are going to be so tired of campaigning this year that they aren't going to want to hear it. So anyway, that's my, that, Chris, is what I had suggested. Thank you. Sorry to make you back up and explain. No, that's fine. Thank you. So, Will? Yes. Please let me know if anybody can't hear me at any point doing this through my phone. We will. Um, there's, a, there's a lot there to respond to, Senator White. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm gonna try and start with the most specific thing, which is that um, to conduct the statewide mailing to all the voters, to every voter of a particular ballot for them, um, you're right, the ballot printing is probably the easiest part of that is the simple part. It's what mm -hmm. we do all the time. And that always waits until after the primary. Um, one minor piece is that we have to and already have ordered significantly more stock, ballot stock, to mm -hmm. put those general election ballots on. Because if you're going to mail one to every registered voter, the 550,000 active voters, you also need to have additional ballots available for the polling place. Mm -hmm. so you need to print more than enough. You need to print two for some voters in some cases because you're gonna mail one to everybody. As you mentioned, everybody is not required to and may not return that ballot either by mail or in person and they can show up at the polling place. So you need additional stock mm -hmm. at the polling place. Um, I'll set that aside for right now. The ballots are the easy part. <laughs> the mailing house process is the very difficult and complex part. And I think you get that too. And, I, and that's why mm -hmm. everybody's telling us to prepare, 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 go ahead, enter the contracts. 
spend probably three hundred thousand to six hundred thousand um, dollars doing that. Um, but that process is very complex. I've reached out to we we have two printers that print our ballots. It's a redundancy measure, so that if anything ever happened to one of them in the lead up to the election, the other could take over. What's become clear as I'm planning this process is that it's gonna be ideal for the mailing to actually happen from each of those different printers. The ballots that that printer prints will get mailed from that location and, and the other from the other. Makes sense for a lot of reasons from an efficiency standpoint. Um, both of them have told me that they need to know whether we're moving forward and doing this by the end of this month, no later than, would rather know now. Um, the, in, the, in the communications around that, the, the explanation for that is that there are many pieces to put in place to make sure that this happens in a timely manner um, in September. So we would, we will, are going to and will have to enter into those contracts and do all of that work, all of that coordination mm -hmm. that involves, I think I've described to you before, significant work on our end, on our programming side with the, the company who provides my election management software um, to account for the, this new process. Um, that involves the, the ability to enter all of these, every voter in Vermont as having been sent a ballot at the same time, so that our clerks don't have to go in and individually do that for every voter on their checklist, which is the process now under the current system, because they get requests mm -hmm. one by one on a rolling basis and do it for each voter. We need to develop a file that's going to come out of that voter uh, election management system that's essentially our voter checklist but with additional information that those printers will need. The ballot style that's assigned to each of those voters, um, the mailing address that they will have <laughs> included in either their request or their voter record. So it's just setting up the fields in that file in the way that's most ideal to allow the printers to do this very complex mailing again. Um, this is all to say that if we were an I guess I'll step back. I guess you all probably know that I just think it's a very, very bad idea to leave this decision until after the primary in August. I think it's untenable, um, frankly. Um, we're gonna go ahead and put those contracts and those systems in place on the assumption that we're doing it. If we were yeah. to decide not to after the primary, the only other option at that point is for the clerks to do this process from their offices. I cannot do this, this is the particular answer to kind of your idea from last night. We cannot do from the state level, the rolling requests. These mailing houses are gonna get this all set up and it's a massive job. And they're thinking about, you know, you, you run one set of ballot styles at one time, the envelopes that go with them, you pair them together. There is no way that they will be standing on standby with the whole mailing operation for a three month period doing single ballot combining for us or even big batches, right? Weekly batches. I can give you an example that comes up already yeah. with the current plan. We're gonna send all the ballots out to all the voters. And one of the things that I need to plan among the many, for instance, with those mailing houses and that will affect the size of the contract and the scope of the contract is whether or not they do follow-up mailings at any iterative basis for new registrants or for people who haven't returned a ballot yet. My current approach to that is no, they're gonna do a single mailing in September and the clerks will take care of the dribbles that come in. It's another reason why we need additional mm -hmm. ballots printed for those dribbles. We can't do that from the state. My staff obviously can't. There's four of us dealing with everything else we're dealing with with elections and we can't send absentee ballots to the entire registered voter population. Even on the rolling request basis, we expect mm -hmm. a significant amount of requests by absentee ballot this year. So it's doing it with those contracts we had set up and in place with the mailing houses in September or asking the clerks to do it on a request basis, essentially like they currently do now. Um, and that's the, the sort of most targeted way that I can say why that doesn't make sense. Um, in terms of voter education, I have to disagree with you, I'm sorry. Um, my feeling is that the primary is gonna happen as the primary happens. There's no real education associated with that at this point, especially because we're designing right now this postcard with a tear off request that we're gonna send in June to all the active voters 
we're taking that additional step for August now. It's been amazing to me to learn over the last month as the debate about what we're gonna do has played out across the state, um, how little people know about our current process and how much confusion there is about absentee voting. Um, so we wanna take the time now to, to communicate that they're gonna be sent a ballot in November. And without having any change to the process in August, I think that that's doable. It's not, um, it's, the, it's the one change that's happening. November is also gonna play out exactly the way it is for everybody, except for the fact that everybody's gonna get a ballot put under their nose with a return envelope to the clerk. Um, I can leave it there for now and open it up to questions or more thoughts from the committee, I think, at this point. So, um, does uh, Paul, did you want to weigh in here? I mean, I think we know what you're going to say, but would you like to weigh in? And you're on mute. Yes, yeah, sorry. I, I would love to uh, speak briefly, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for the record, Paul Burns, the Executive Director of VPERG. Um, and VPIRG is strongly supportive of moving forward to, uh, in the general election, mail every registered voter a ballot in the way that Bill has described and that the Secretary of State has proposed to the governor. Um, there are a, a number of different organizations and businesses that have gotten on board with this idea. We have sent to Gail, and I believe she's shared with you, uh, an op-ed that I wrote earlier this week that has links to a lot of other information and articles. More than 1,700 Vermonters have already signed on to a petition urging uh, the state to move forward uh, with a universal vote by mail system. No, don't use vote by mail. We are going to use vote by mail because that's what we want to do. So I'm sorry to disagree with you. Okay. But right now we have 30% of Vermonters who in a, in a typical general election either vote early or vote with an absentee ballot. But that leaves more than 200,000 Vermonters who typically vote and show up to the polls. What we would like to do is reduce the number of people who are showing up at the polls on election day to encourage them to vote safely from home. And that means voting by mail. Voting by mail has meaning to people now like it never has before. And it has incredible public support. 72% of Americans now support voting by mail in this upcoming general election. And if we did a poll in Vermont, my expectation is that the number would be even higher than that. So we do want people to use this opportunity to vote by mail instead of showing up at the polling place if they possibly can. It's important that we preserve in-person voting for those who need or want to do that. But for the benefit of the clerks, the poll workers, many of whom are senior citizens and volunteers, and for the voters themselves, we would like very much to reduce those numbers of people showing up at polling places on election day. We have the benefit now of not hindsight, but foresight. Six months we have to prepare for this election. Imagine if the country had moved expeditiously to a plan and take action when we first learned of the COVID uh, problem and virus. But instead that didn't happen at the federal level and we are suffering in some respects the consequences of that inaction. There's no reason for this state to stumble into the November elections by waiting until after the August primary. Instead, we can begin and move forward and act and communicate effectively by moving forward now in all the ways that we'll describe that I, I certainly won't repeat to you. But I, I can't, I think that there are all sorts of reasons why it makes sense to move forward. And honestly, I can't think of any reason not to, because in August, we are not going to know what the COVID situation is going to be in November. The governor won't know. You won't know. Anthony Fauci won't be able to tell you what COVID-19 looks like in November come August 29th. You know, but so, the, so you're not going to know with certainty that we should or shouldn't move forward, even at that time. So if there is no reason not to go forward, let's make the decision now and have certainty and allow it to be as effective as possible. Thank you for the opportunity. I have lots more information, but if you look at the 
the op-ed that we sent, there are lots of links there. The last thing I'll mention, Madam Chair, is that this is not a situation that creates more barriers to voting. If anything, it makes it a bit easier for some people to vote. And in Colorado, one of the studies that is linked to in the op-ed uh, is, is one just came out in the last week or, or 10 days. And it shows that in Colorado, they adopted uh, this system of voting in 2013. Um, this analysis suggests that their voting has gone up across the board by about 9% that they link to this system of voting making it easier for people to cast a ballot. So if anything, we're inviting more people to participate easily in the process of voting this year and to do so in a way that protects their health and the health of elections workers. Thank you. And I, I agree with everything except the uh, phrase vote by mail, because I think that we can encourage people to vote by mail, but if we call it vote by mail, people and I've had conversations with people who assume that that's the only way they'll be able to vote, that there will not be polls. So we need to, what, however we, we um, phrase this messaging, we need to make it clear that this is not doing away with your right to go to the polls. I, I, agree, Madam Chair. I agree, Madam Chair, that we, uh, the coalition of groups and the letters that we sent to the Secretary of State and Governor said we, we want three things. One is to have the universal uh, ballots sent out universally to, to registered voters mm -hmm. to serve the in-person voting. So I totally agree with you on that. And the third is just to, that the state must engage in a broad public education campaign and to work with many of the businesses and organizations not in a non uh, partisan way, obviously, to just educate people about how this process works, because it is yeah. totally different for, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of voters in the state. Thank you. I'll be quiet and, and allow you to, to move forward. I appreciate the opportunity. Chris? Um, uh, I, Paul, I just wanted to check in. So I, I understand the chair's concern about any particular name we come up with that wasn't the default in the under the current system, but um, you looked at other states and uh, wh what is the default phrase? I mean, even if it's... Well, often now you see there is a distinction that oftentimes people are making between absentee balloting, which is of course what Vermont has had for many years and has been worked, has worked well effectively without problems uh, for tens of thousands of Vermonters. But we want wants to distinguish typically between absentee balloting where the, the burden is on the voter to request a ballot to be sent to them versus what is often now referred to as universal vote by mail. That The implication there is that all registered voters are receiving a ballot automatically. Okay. And is it Washington state that does all its voting by mail? There are now five states that use the vote by mail process principally. Um, uh, several of them also have in-person voting available. Colorado is another one of those states, Oregon, Utah, and Hawaii, I believe. Will can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and <laughs> thanks. And Colorado is one of those that has also adopted some of the other measures that Vermont has. So for instance, uh, same-day voter registration. And that's one other way that they encourage people to continue to participate in the process. Vermont is in a relatively good position. For the 45 states that have not yet adopted this system of voting, few are in any better position than we are to move forward to do it for this general election because of all the other reforms that, frankly, you members of this committee have already, uh, in many cases, uh, dreamt up and, and moved forward and passed. And, and with the successful impl uh, implementation from the Secretary of State's office, it puts us in a pretty good spot, far better than, than many other states. Right. I know that when I've talked with voters, I've trained myself in, I don't know, the last half dozen years to not to try never to use the word absentee ballot anymore. Yes. Yeah. You're allowed to vote early because absentee has this connotation for a lot of folks of you need an excuse, a reason, permission, blah, 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 as opposed to, no, you just have an option, you know, show up at the town clerk's office or request it by mail, but vote anytime. Uh, at your choice up to 45 days early. Okay, thanks. So I, I think that, um, I, I mean, we have no action to take on this. We've already, we've already given the go ahead to the Secretary of State to, to do this. 
and I, my feeling is go ahead. My lame brain ideas were just that. And um, I would say the governor's letter said, go ahead, get prepared, do everything you need to do. And I think that's what, what you should do. And um, assume that we're going to vote mail a ballot to everybody. And if, who knows what's gonna happen in September, October. And then I would like to, to jump into the, the rest of the discussion here, but I see Anthony and Chris both have, and Allison, Anthony? Well, when I first started hearing about this, I thought, well, it's not so hard. We just assume we're gonna do it, do it by mail. And we could pull the plug at the last minute if we don't decide not to. But now from listening to Will, that doesn't seem like a practical thing to do. Mm -hmm. So the question I have now is when you say go ahead and do it, the, my, my question is whether the bill we passed gives the governor the chance to override what we may want to do. So come August, we all say today, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do the vote by mail or whatever we call it. And then August comes and we still say, yeah, we're going to do whatever we, we're going to do the vote by mail or whatever we call it. Does the governor have the power to stop, jump up and say, no, I don't agree with this. And so you're not going to be able to do it because the bill said that he has to be in agreement. So that's the question I have is whether or not he could kibosh the idea at the last minute. And if so, then do we need to pass another bill that says that we're going to do what we're going to do without being interfered with by the governor? I suppose that um, he could he could do that. I think that he would do that at his peril, because I think that there are enough people in Vermont that um, support this idea that I, I don't think it would be very wise of him to do it. And he did say, I, I mean, we could also always pass something else, I guess, because he said if the legislature decided to to say this is what we're going to do, he wouldn't stand in. That's what he said at the press conference. So I don't know if, Will and Chris, how do you feel? Do you feel that we need to do something? And then we'll jump to Chris Bray had a question and then Allison. Sure. Can we just I, make, I appreciate I'm sorry. Can I, I just wanna ask Betsy if she agrees that the governor oh. or thinks that the governor could okay. just say no at the last minute. Betsy? Hi, Betsy Ann Rass, Legislative Council. Yes, I think the governor can say no. The language is that the Secretary of State is authorized in consultation and agreement with the governor to order a permit appropriate okay. procedures. And that was our take on it as well. And that's why there's uncertainty in this whole process. And we would like that certainty. Yeah, I just wanted to be clear that we're all clear on that. Going into okay. And just very quickly, Senator, if I may, I just want to thank um, Paul Burns for bringing the focus back to the public health and safety. And this is this process that of putting a ballot under every registered voter's nose in November is our recommendation for the best way to drive down attendance at the polling places in November. And so I just hope everybody stays focused on the health and safety aspect of this in addition to protecting a person's right to vote. And then as far as legislative action, we continue to work with the governor's office. Even though they rejected our proposal last week, uh, we're continuing to have conversations with them, um, correspond back and forth, ask additional questions, get additional questions answered, we hope. Um, and so we don't think the time is right uh, yet for any legislative action. We're not making that, that request at this point. Okay. That was my question. Chris? Honestly, I'm a little <laughs> disappointed we're having, we're having to have this conversation at all because it seems entirely unnecessary given the kind of, uh, I don't know how to understand what the administration's position is when they say we're, we don't wanna be in the middle of it so there's a way to not be in the middle of it. That is to say, I planned henceforth to defer entirely to the chief elections officer of the state of Vermont, period, full stop. But we're not hearing that. We hear that there could be a choice later on and that brings uncertainty back into the whole thing in a system where everyone would like, not for political reasons, but just simply to protect 
the vote, which is so fundamental from any kind of problem. So as well as the public health and safety issues, which to me are always um, an overriding concern. So I don't know if we should ask to have legislation drafted so we could be ready to take prompt action. Uh, it seems to me as though we were almost invited to do so by the governor who said, if there were a bill, um, then I, I, would, I would be fine with that. If it's clarity for the administration that it's the legislature making this choice, then uh, I'm feeling fully confident in, in the Secretary of State's office to do this well. And I would love to make it their job easier and the messaging to Vermonters far more clear and direct, like that we're not gonna have questions hanging over us all summer long about what the fall will look like, how will the pandemic be receding or growing, I'd say let's let's ditch all that and just be declarative and straightforward. So, uh, I, I really appreciate that, Senator Bray. And if I could, Madam Chair, just very quickly, we're we're struggling to understand exactly what the the governor's objections are. He said he's not philosophically opposed to uh, mailing a ballot to every voter. That he's not concerned about ballot fraud. Um, that he doesn't want to be in this position. He didn't want to be in the position between uh, the Secretary of State's office and elections. And has, has said very publicly that he trusts and defers to our office as the experts in the conduct of elections. But he's still got a few remaining concerns that we're just trying to understand better and hope that we can address. And we hope that that can be done this week. Um, and if not, I think it'll be time to start thinking about plan B. Um, but as I said, at this point, we're not asking you to do anything, but of course your prerogative to, to you know, put, put things together and, and be prepared to do something if you think that's the right course of action. So Madam Chair, sorry, can I just finish based on that? If, if your game, I, I, I would hope the committee might consider preparing draft legislation just so that we could act expeditiously if we decided that was our course, as opposed to making decision in two or three days and then having to, to ask Betsy Ann to scramble or something like that. Thank you. That's what I was gonna suggest, but let's go to Allison. Uh, well, Chris and, and, Chris and uh, Anthony really summarized because I've had emails asking, I mean, we've all had emails. Thank you, Paul, your beeper crowd has been very active. Um, the, but the, <laughs> I, I thought it was fairly clear in his letter that he gave, he deferred to your expertise, he gave you the green light, um, but I, I'm, I'm concerned that if we do it legislatively, we have done it legislatively, and we added that agreement bit with the governor, which I in some ways now regret. We should have left the expertise with the Secretary of State. So I, I in some ways, but we did that also to get to unanimously move forward on this. I am concerned about the divisiveness if we do it legislatively that we might, uh, um, you know, that it might be divisive. And uh, I think we're all united on the objectives here. And uh, on the other hand, I think we can't wait. It, it, it needs to happen. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of torn between not wanting to make this a wedge issue between Democrats and Republicans. Uh, I, I see us all united on our objectives here. Um, so I, I, those, are, those are sort of my concerns. Otherwise, I would say let's do legislation tomorrow because that was our intent. So I, I am not sure that this is a Vermont partisan issue. Because I think that the governor is not, I, I may be wrong here, but I don't think he sees this necessarily as a partisan issue, that he's, he's not I, worried I, about the same thing that the National Republican Party is concerned with. He's not saying those same things. I, I so agree. I, I, I am think not, I, yes? I just think within the legislature, it creates an opportunity. I, it does, but I, I would hope that the governor as the, if not the actual leader of the Republican party in Vermont, the 
titular leader um, would be able to indicate to people that this is not necessarily a partisan issue and that that um, I, I, I think his concerns are he really just wants it to be back to normal and he wants elections. So I, I, I don't think he thinks of this as a partisan issue. I, I might be wrong, but Chris? So, yeah, I, I think one of the ways we most go off the rails as legislators is to speculate on motivation for anything. So I want to leave that out entirely and just say, um, you know, I take the governor at his word. He said, uh, basically, we have an invitation to pass legislation that clarifies this. I, I don't see any reason to look and under the hood. I don't see anything yeah. to be looking or democratic about it. I just see uh, our, our chief officer saying, um, uh, I invite the legislature to legislate on this if they think it will bring more clarity to the situation. And yeah. like, you know, again, for me, it's just, uh, we don't need to worry. I don't see it as a wedge issue. There's an invitation to legislate our intent, we've already articulated, was clear at the outset. We were just trying to be, I think, cordial. Uh, and now if, if that has created some room for confusion, let's uh, take the offer at face value and right. move, move a bill that eliminates the confusion. Well, Brian? Brian? Yeah. Brian. Brian. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I just feel the need to, again, uh, weigh in and say that I do oppose the plan going forward. And since we last talked about this, um, I've heard from two of the clerks in my county, including the city clerk of the largest municipality, who is very, very opposed to this and said that he would reach out to Will. Um, I don't know whether he has yet or not. Um, so I just, I still have concerns of uh, as much as I enjoy working with both Will and Chris uh, from the secretary's office on 99% of what else we do, um, this is one issue where I, I just, I'm not on board. So Will, have um, clerks reached out to you in opposition? And if so, what is their opposition? It truly is a mixed bag. Um, I hear from clerks who strongly support the idea and those who don't. Um, for me personally, the personal contacts to me have been more on the support side, but I, I really don't want to assert, you know, how many are out there. I have not talked to all of them or nearly all of them. I will tell you that I've talked to a lot of the ones from the bigger cities um, who have expressed their support for this in general. Um, one that I was really pleased by was uh, when the Bennington town clerk recently um, oh. followed up with me and said that she supported our plan in general um, when she had had a lot of opposition to even giving us the authority um, in the first place. And Senator Colmore, I know Henry well and would be happy to talk to him. And it has been my experience that a lot of that, that, that the clerks who opposed the idea initially um, are more comfortable with it once they have a chance for me to explain how we are going to do it. For instance, I would hope that he's entirely clear that we're only sending to active voters. That's a major concern among the clerks is also sending to the inactive challenge voters on their list and we've taken that off the table. And also that he understands that we're offering to perform it um, from a central location and wouldn't be asking him and his poll workers to manage the mailing process. But some people are just opposed to the idea in general too and I'd be happy to talk to Henry. Thank you. Okay. Chris, did you have another comment? Uh, you asked the question. I just didn't, you know, uh, of course, I'd love to hear what concerns are emerging from town clerks who have a ground, ground level view of election day proceedings. Um, then again, um, you know, we're legislating for the whole state. There's not a a second plenary body of town clerks who are designing our elections. So I think we, we can give, um, we can create clarity for everyone. So what I would suggest perhaps is Betsy, if you could just in anticipation and at the governor's invitation, um, 
draft something up for us that we could look at in case we feel we should do it. But I would I would follow um, the Secretary of State's office and not do anything until they feel the time is appropriate. Can you? Are, are we back to the plane going down the runway, Madam Chair? <laughs> I think we're about to crash because <laughs> I think that that we have been we're off the runway and we're still on the ground. <laughs> um, but does that make sense, committee, to have just an um, uh, how? And I guess um, working with Will to to figure out the best way of saying this in a, um, and it is as Chris pointed out, the at the governor's invitation that we would be cons even considering this. You know, I, I in the, out of respect for Senator Collimore's, you know, concerns, maybe we, I don't know if Will, if you could, um, not right now off the top of your head, but maybe for a future meeting of this committee, just, um, enumerate some of the concerns you've heard and how the program you're designing addresses those concerns. Maybe you've been able to resolve them all, maybe not all of them, but it would just be, I, um, I want to respect, you know, that again, the town clerk experience on the ground doing elections firsthand. So um, it'd be helpful to me as a member of this committee to hear what you've been hearing and how you may or been able to address them. I'd be happy to, Senator Bray. I, I just gave you a couple examples. One other that comes right off the top of my head is um, what I spoke about actually at the beginning that I was working on with our um, programmers, the ability to enter in all of the request and issuance of these ballots to them in the election management system centrally. Um, a lot of the clerks are still worried that they're gonna be asked to go in and enter these request and issue dates for all of their voters. Thank you. I think, and I think my general message, I've tried to give a general message to them. I, I communicate with them all as a group fairly regularly, once every week or so. Um, and my general message has been, I'm not just gonna say that you're sending ballots to all of your voters and leave you out to figure it out. Um, that we are here and thinking about designing the system in the way that will make it easiest for them and reduce their exposure, which again, is everybody's goal. So thanks. Can I ask one quick follow-up? Kind of sorry. The uh, I'm making up for all those months where I had no questions. Um, the, <laughs> is there amongst town clerks, since there are so many, is there sort of a, a an election subgroup that you know helps gather the the opinion of town clerks, distill it down, and that you can work with them? Otherwise, it does seem a little unwieldy to ask you to. Um, check in with 246 towns that are all voting. Yeah, I appreciate that. And it's not um, an election specific subgroup, but the subgroup that we have been communicating with and have reached out to about this is the legislative committee of the Vermont Clerks and Treasurers Association, the VMCTA. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, I would, um, I think that in, coming up with some sort of potential legislation that uh, in there, I would make it very clear that this is not requiring people to mail in their ballots. I still think that is important because I think that there are people who, when they read vote by mail, they assume that there's not gonna be any other option. And I think that if we do anything that, whether it's a bill or a uh, re resolution or whatever, that it needs to be clear that this is a mailing out, it's a mailing out to everybody, it's an option for how you return them. And in the, in the um, education program that is likely to happen, it can be stressed that there are different ways of voting here. It is not, it is not just voting by mail. And I think that that's, 
I know when when we talked in committee before when we talked about it in I think it was Oregon does Oregon do it and my understanding was that their only option was to mail in their ballots that they did not have polling places where they could go and so I think that if if I misunderstood that then there are certainly a lot of people out there who aren't as immersed in it as we are that misunderstand that also. So I think it, in anything we do, we need to make it very clear that it is not a requirement to vote, send in your ballot. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sure. So you're emphasizing um, that it's ballots delivered by mail. Right. Yes. That's exactly what she is. We are mailing a ballot to right. everyone. How you choose to return that ballot is yeah. your choice. If you want to mail it back, if you want to drop it in a safe deposit box that the town clerk might do, if you want to take it down to the town clerk's office, or if you want to appear at the poll, it's entirely up to you. It's your decision, the voter's decision. And that I think is misunderstood by a lot of people. So, okay. all right, Betsy, are we all set? We haven't done anything about transition or lessons learned on elections. Well, well we're learning not. We're, we're learning something about the bill we passed. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I think the lesson learned here is that we should have stuck to our initial guns, which was keeping the power and the choice with the Secretary of State and not adding that agreement with the governor. I know it was a concession and I and I understand that and I appreciate it at the time, but I, I think had we known that this would have created um, this, I, I, I would have kept it all with the Secretary of State. And I honestly think the governor probably would have been happier about that too. Yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, am I remembering correct? Oops, am I remembering correctly that the governor did not ask for that phrase? No. Right. Our House uh, members did. I don't know where it originated, but. It must it have been Allison's idea. With <laughs> House members. Yeah. It, okay, so do we know where we're going with this? We'll, Betsy will draft something up, some potential language for us. We won't do anything until Chris or Will get back to us. We will, um, Chris will um, talk with the town clerks who are, or Will will talk to the town clerks who are still um, reluctant and find out what their issues are and maybe their issues will go away. Maybe they won't. If it's a philosophical issue, they probably won't go away, but if it's a, procedural issue, they might go away. And then we'll come back to this, Allison. My concern uh, is Will Will's deadline at the end of May and our getting legislation passed by that time. Uh, oh. So I would say that we have a drop dead date of that because we have to get it passed by the Senate, it's going to the House. It's gonna take a few days, it's gonna take a week plus. So, um, my, I would think we would have to make that decision at our meeting on Friday afternoon. Well, or, or call a special meeting Monday to ask to be on the Senate calendar on Tuesday morning. Right, right. That's what I was thinking that we are meeting on Friday and um, we'll have an talk update. to Chris and Will again on Friday to see where we are. And, um, and we can again, um, uh, in cry individually try to encourage the governor to Chris. Um, uh, I don't want to belabor this, but I'm just thinking we just talked about the how we refer to this. So maybe in what Betsy Ann is drafting, we could refer to delivery of ballots by mail, which seems quite concrete, straightforward. And it doesn't talk about the voting piece at all. It's just, I mean, that'll get in there eventually. Right. Delivery I, I of ballots by right game. Thank you. Betsy? Hello. Uh, I have to get going to House GovOps. I think you're, are you done with elections at two? 
I think so. Okay. Um, and is, um, I'll just work with the director of elections if that's so we can get the language to what would work administratively for the Secretary of State's office on this language. Mm -hmm. Sound good? Okay. I Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you all. I have to get going to House GovOps, but uh, Will, I'll be in touch with you. Okay. Great. All right. Look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy Ann. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, well, um, lessons learned. Mm -hmm. Be careful what you ask for. Or be careful when someone asks you something. So where are we? With, I, um, I'm, I'm not, not sure. sure. I'm not sure we're clear on it yet. Well, we're not clear on that. I. Um, we have um, Peter Elwell with us, and I don't know if we have um, Tucker. Uh, we do not. Adam, Gail? Here, I'm just going to drop off. I just want to thank you okay. for the opportunity. Thank you, Paul. Same here. Thank you very much, everybody. Yep. You're welcome. Thank Peterson. you. Thank you. I'm not going to dream about elections anymore, so <laughs> don't worry. We hope not. <laughs> You'll be dreaming about elections through November, probably every day. <laughs> um, Gail, did you? Yeah, the Adjutant General will be joining us shortly. Okay, so maybe um, what we'll do is we'll jump, since we have both Karen Horn and Peter Elwell here right now, we'll jump to... Um, uh, 947 that was given to us uh, this morning. I can't. Oh, and there's Damien. Damien, are you the the author of that? Uh, no, that would be Tucker. Oh, that would be Tucker. And okay. Tucker. Oh, Damien, you're here for military. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Karen and Peter, so that uh, what? So, um, until Greg Knight joins us, do you want to tell us what 947 is? And um, it was sent to us today. Do we have a copy of it? It is on your website, Madam Chair. Okay. Okay. Under Tucker, under Tucker Anderson. Uh, got it. Yep. Got it. Okay. Do you want to tell us what it is? I think I understand it, but just explain it to us. And why well, the, it's important to do now? The bill would provide for a municipality to adopt a municipal budget and a tax rate if they have not yet had an annual meeting for the purposes of adopting the budget. And um, there are only a couple of towns, uh, Brattleboro being one that has not yet had its town meeting because it's a representative town meeting and um, Peter can speak to that. And the other town is Barrytown. They have actually scheduled a um, town meeting for June 1 and we'll see what happens with that, how they address that. I'm, I'm not sure of the details of how they're gonna hold that election. Um, there are also a few villages, and I'm afraid I, I don't have the list of villages here that have not yet had their votes, their annual meeting votes. So um, that that's really what it would allow the municipality to do, an, adopt a budget and a tax rate until they're in a position where they can have a uh, actual town vote. Okay. And you may want to um go next okay peter thank you senator um yeah so in brattleboro we have representative town meeting and the way that works is um on town meeting day when all the other towns are holding town meetings um we have an election where 140 residents of the town who have run for um, town meeting representative as an elected office um get elected um, and then our town meeting is held um, three, three weeks later on a Saturday, um, usually for all day. Um, the way the structure works and the 
active participation of our um, citizens here in Brattleboro. We've got a, a long tradition of that nine o'clock meeting going at least until two or three in the afternoon. Last year, it went until about 930 at night. It's not uncommon that it goes until about six or seven. Um, so we, we have uh, full warnings and long discussions and lots of parliamentary action that goes on, um, and amendments and uh, you know multiple votes to cease debate. A lot of times there'll be a motion to cease debate and then it, it fails and there's another one a little while later. So that I say all that just to give you a little flavor for the challenge of trying to hold such a meeting with 140 voting representatives in this format, uh, whether that be Zoom or go to meeting or whichever. So we're really concerned about that. We don't think that's a we think that's bad for the democratic process to try to hold a meeting of that larger group of people with that much um, active participation um, in this format. And we want to preserve the ability, hopefully as the summer goes along um, to with proper spacing in a you know, proper setting, possibly even outdoors, um, hold the representative town meeting for 2020. Um, because of the timing, if you remember back to March as this unfolded with COVID-19, um, the, uh, town the towns that held town meeting on town meeting day were able to do that. But by the time March 21st came around, which was when our representative town meeting had been warned for on its usual Saturday, three weeks later, um, we, we weren't able to um, safely and legally have 140 representatives and another 30 or so people in a room. So the workaround, um, there was some initial discussion of having this in the bill that you already have all um, passed both in the Senate and the House, I believe signed by the governor now, um, that put, provides broader flexibility regarding um, tax deadlines and tax penalties and interest um, that municipalities can exercise on a case-by-case -case basis for what is fitting for their community. We appreciate that, um, but in our particular situation, um, we also need the ability to have an adopted budget and an approved tax rate by July 1st in order to ensure continuity of government into the new fiscal year. And so um, what uh, H947 does um, as approved by the house and we hope soon to be approved by you in the Senate um, will um, allow the select board this year only during the COVID-19 situation um, to um, adopt the budget and approve the tax rate so that we can continue into the fiscal year without running out of money and having to borrow. Um, and then when we're able to hold a representative town meeting, which we hope to do in possibly as soon as July, but certainly somewhere between July and September before the predicted um, return and you know, new surge of cases that may come upon us all in the fall, um, then we would hold the representative town meeting and address the larger body of business and I, it, the, the legislation isn't explicitly clear on this, but um, I can tell you that the um, political moors in Brattleboro are such that um, the, the select board will put its adopted budget back before representative town meeting to make sure it either gets ratified or modified. Um, that, that's not, like I said, explicit in the legislation which allows the select board to adopt a budget. Um, but I'm certain that that's the way it would proceed here um, because I don't think representative town meeting will have it any other way. If you didn't put it before them, they would bring it up anyway. Uh, well, they wouldn't be able to bring it up for action, um, but no. I, there would be consequences. Yes. <laughs> there would be political consequences to um, having a select board adopt a budget and then not warn that same budget when it could for ratifying action by the town meeting. One other quick thing, if I might, I know you've got folks waiting, but it just if it gives you any greater comfort in terms of the unusual circumstances here, um, the last two years in a row, our representative town meeting has actually increased the budget that the select board sent to them um, before adopting it. So um, it, I'm personally not concerned. I know that you have to take that at face value, but I'm personally not concerned that this will um, sort of... Um, interfere with the taxpayer's ability to um, control unwanted increases. I think there's gonna be a healthy discussion at the select board level before that budget is adopted. And then again, in the ratification process at representative town meeting about the particular circumstances this year, but the general atmosphere at representative town meeting in the last few years has actually been more 
um, interested in raising revenue and increasing service than in cutting taxes. So committee, any questions about this or concerns, Brian? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Peter or whichever person drafted it, what was the vote in the House? Was it just a voice vote? Or was there any opposition? There, you mean on the House floor, Senator? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there, there was not any opposition on the House floor that I recall. I, I'm gonna go back and double check that. There may, but um, there may have been a couple of questions, but there wasn't any opposition. Okay, thank you. And it was unanimous at House GovOps also. Thank you, yes. Peter. Well, with that said, um, since in essence, we've already passed S-344, which by the way, to my knowledge, still has not been signed into law by the governor, um, and does give in essence the same flexibility. In other words, if you had had your town meeting um, earlier, Peter, before the declared state of emergency, you would have already been included in the bill that we already passed. So I don't see that this changes the landscape one bit and I would move that we voted out today. Allison. Wow, she's speechless. Allison, do you want to weigh in? Uh, I'd like to, uh, yes, I'm happy to support this. I think it's uh, important that we get these budgets approved. And, and move forward. Um, but the it was Brattleboro and Barry and what other jurisdictions? A couple villages, she said. We'll get yeah, the names. We'll... Yeah. Okay. So it's it's more than just two. It's a smatter. Yes. It it would it could apply to a few villages as well. We'll make oh. sure we know exactly who they are before we report it on the floor. What Woodstock is one of them. Okay, um, Anthony. Um, I think it's fine. I think we should do Chris? it. Chris. Okay, Chris. Uh, yes, I'm good. Thanks. Are you good? All right. Does somebody want to make a motion? I think Brian did. I will move that the committee vote out <laughs> H nine forty seven. Favorably with no amendments. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Clerk, do you want to call the roll? Absolutely. It is my pleasure. Senator Bray. Yes. Senator Clarkson. Yes. Senator Collimore. Yes. Senator Polina. Yes. Senator White. Yes. Great. Senator Great. Colmore, Motion would you like to report this? You're our usual charter reporter. I'd be glad to, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Thank you. All very right. Much. So I will bring this to the Rules Committee and see if we can get it on the um, floor on Thursday. And Karen or whoever has the information on which other municipalities will be uh, impacted by this, that would be helpful if you could let me know. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay. We won't be voting on it until perhaps Thursday. Thurs I'm hoping that we could do it on Thursday. Okay. 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 All right. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. And I see Thanks. you're not in your car today. I'm not in my car. No. It's lovely. Actually, actually, can I, I want to oh. ask Karen a question to cement cars. Karen, okay. I don't know if you know more about this than I do or not, but before we talked, we were talking about elections. I think the town of Barry has chosen to mail out ballots and have people return them in their cars. It's like a drive through balloting. Did you know anything about that? Um, that may be, I can find out for you. Um, I'm not sure what they had decided to do, but I can find out. Well, I was just curious. If, well, sure, if you can find out, that'd be great. I was just curious because they, yeah. they, they talked about it as, dri as drive-through voting. Oh, okay. They would mail a ballot to everybody, but they would re they could return it by driving through some kind of space where they could 
yeah. drop off their ballots, or they could just fill out a ballot there, but stay in their yeah, cars. Are... It was interesting. <clears throat> right. There are a few towns that have looked at that for um, different kinds of, well, there's a, there's a few um, school budgets, you know, that haven't been, um, they didn't have their meetings yet. So, uh, and at least one of them, Milton looked at um, drive-through voting. So I will find out. All right, thanks. I was just curious, thank you. Okay, and Tucker, Thank you for joining us. We've just passed the bill. I did see Tucker there somewhere. Okay, shall we move on to um, the what we've learned in terms of the military? And this really probably isn't a long conversation, but we thought that um, we should address it since the military is in our uh, jurisdiction and I see the adjutant general has joined us. Am I right? I think you're there. How are you, ma'am? Good. Good. You are here with us. Thank you so much. Um, Connection is not the best, but we'll we'll make do. Okay. So what we're what we're kind of looking at here is three different questions and I think they all got sent to you but um, how we move from this crisis mode to something that is more normal how um, we if there are any things that we need to do now so that we're better prepared it, when this if and when this hits again uh, so that we're not scrambling then we are prepared for it better prepared and um what things have we learned that are um that we addressed in a crisis that could then become permanent changes in better ways of doing things so um if you would like to just talk to us about the kind of those issues around the national guard and how we how we deployed them and how what we might have learned that we should do better and if there's anything that we need to do about it. So take it away. Does that committee, do, do any of you have anything to add to that before we turn it over to the adjutant general? No, no. Okay, all right, so please. Well, thank you, ma'am. So I, I can tell you um, probably from the very beginning, um, we have these things we call warning orders and Vermont was big picture, probably better off than most at the very beginning of this and has remained so. So I, I think having a, a very pragmatic and in some instances aggressive approach early on um, has been very beneficial. But for us, that warning order is it, kind of a predictor of the direction of things. And very at the very beginning, uh, we had our, our medical planners and some of our senior staff officers, including our director of military support, embedded uh, within the state EOC and with the um, health operations center kind of as a liaison. And that information uh, through all their meetings was fed very efficiently back to us. So we were uh, pretty well prepared and postured um, to get folks in the right status at the right time. Now, concurrent with that, of course, is the transition, and this is not a problem for, for Senate GovOps, it's more my problem working with the governor's office and our U.S. Purchasing and Fiscal Office, um, and that's getting us transitioned uh, from state active duty into Title 32 under Sections 502F, um, and all that does, the long and short of it is it, it takes us off of state money and state funding and gets us on to federal funding. And that comes with a mission assignment uh, from FEMA. So, so long as those soldiers and airmen are on orders that align with those mission assignments uh, assigned by FEMA, then we would receive federal funding. And, and we've been uh, very good at getting that done and had a very quick turnaround uh, with the state EOC, with Director Borneman, uh, working with the governor's office to get that to the White House through DOD for approval. But uh, are there things we can do better? Um, I'm sure there are. 
Uh, but from my perspective, it, it's been about as seamless as we could make it. Um, and, and I could walk you through some of the things the guard's been doing uh, at the direction and request of the governor, uh, if that's of interest to you. Sure, committee. Okay, sure. So uh, one of the first undertakings we did, we established a triage site uh, in conjunction with the University of Vermont Medical Center, and that was our Charlie company, our medical company from the Brigade Support Battalion. And over the matter of probably three days, um, very quickly had a site established up there uh, preparing for, well, we didn't know what, but uh, the potential of a surge. And then shortly following that, um, our Air Guard civil engineers, and in conjunction with our 40th Army Band, uh, built the Essex alternate care location, that's the 400-bed um, alternate uh, care location, and that was inclusive of water and power um, and, and those 400 beds. And then they took it even further and built an isolation pod of 50 beds um, within six days. And then on the seventh day, the uh, mission changed to the potential of having COVID-positive patients and then within literally a matter of hours, they had converted that 50 bed isolation pod into a negative pressure area. So you could keep COVID positive patients there for treatment. Now, it, what's important here is I shared what we did, um, what those civil engineers did in conjunction with our band in building that and the cost. And overall, it was about $230,000 uh, to get it built and up and running, and that's inclusive of power and electricity. Uh, that became, in essence, the best practice. I briefed it on a teleconference with the Chief of National Guard Bureau and the 54, sent the plans to some of our sister state adjutants general, and then they, in turn, uh, I probably went through National Guard Bureau, went to all the state FEMA reps um, because that the cost and efficiency with, with which our folks built that um, in my view, was was unprecedented. So it was great work, a little bit of Yankee ingenuity perhaps, but it was uh, very well received, and, and we're paying it forward to the rest of the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past uh, three weeks, we've distributed over 520,000 FEMA meals ready to eat uh, throughout Vermont, and that again is the Brigade Support Battalion. That's our transportation soldiers doing that. Uh, the Air National Guard is still managing the SNS warehouse in uh, Colchester. We've uh, got five personnel assisting with plans. Uh, and again, that's inclusive of our dir uh, director of military support, working with the state EOC and Director Borneman and her team. And we've also got five teams available if the request comes uh, to assist with uh, testing. But that's where we are right now, ma'am. Uh, so um, can you just tell us how many meals, again, how many meals ready to eat you distributed? Uh, about 520,000. Wow. So um, of, of the people who have been um, build, doing the building and all the other things, do we have any sense of how many of them um, had perhaps lost their, their civilian jobs that um, so they were ready to be called? I mean, did we end up taking people away from um, other essential jobs to put them there? Or were many of these people in a position where they were not essential workers and could could fill the, the need? The only one that I know of that was taken at least for a brief period um, was a first responder. And yeah. uh, we spoke to that soldier and he was actually sent back um, to the, the rescue squad that, that he worked for. Mm -hmm. So that was very quickly resolved. So we, we mm -hmm. didn't have any further issues than that. A, a number of folks that we have on orders um, were full timers. I don't have the percentages off the top of my head, but I don't know of anybody um, that was uh, without work or unemployed because of this crisis that there certainly may be some. Mm -hmm. All right, because I was thinking that if people had lost their their other jobs, this was great for them to then be able to hopefully be paid through FEMA somehow for um, for this work. Right, that would take a little bit of research. 
but we could probably find that out if that's something you're interested in, ma'am. You know, if it's easy to do, but there are a lot of things you have to do. So I'm not sure that it's worth a lot of effort. Okay. Any other questions or concerns or Allison? Um, Greg, did you have a, a pandemic plan in place or the National Guard nationally? Well, we have a, um, well, it was every day, but now we're doing it three times a week. Every state is different. Every state's been affected, obviously, uh, and impacted differently. Uh, for us, we, we very quickly, in, in fact, before it became policy within the state, um, established alternate work schedules and, and what we were calling virtual drills. There's always something to do, and, and not everything we do has to take place at an armory or at the wing. So, for instance, the wing uh, got ahead of it and started doing a rotating work schedule, um, maintaining the social distancing and sanitizing very early on in this. And we've been very fortunate. We've only had a handful of folks who have been affected. Um, and, and obviously, in the forefront of all this is making sure we preserve the readiness of the force. So that was the, the driving reason to get ahead of this and make those decisions early. Right. I, I guess I meant, I mean, you did you have a, a pandemic specific plan in place before this even hit? I mean, did yes, you? Yes, ma'am. I'm yeah. sorry, I misunderstood the question. Yes, that's the Vermont All Hazards Plan. And, and, and although we haven't specifically rehearsed this particular um, pandemic type scenario, uh, a lot of the other tabletop exercises we do, for instance, with Vigilant Guard, uh, still provides us a good rehearsal for something like this. And so having that plan in place helped you roll it out, as you said, seamlessly? Yes, ma'am. Um, certainly there were a few staff hiccups, but that was uh, until we, it wasn't very long. Uh, we got our feet under us, and, and all, we, everybody knows everybody, and that's the benefit of, of doing what we do. Um, keep habitual relationships, um, you know, with the governor's office. I, I communicate with them uh, very regularly. Colonel Gates is down with SEOC, um, and Mike Smith and, and Mike Sherling. So right. it, it's been really good, and that's probably central, uh, I think, to our success in, in executing whatever been, has been asked of us is, is the effective communication. And, and just to finish up on that, how often do you update that all hazards plan? I would have to check, ma'am. I'm not sure the last time it was updated. Thanks. If you let yeah. us know, that would yeah, be Yeah, I believe what, yeah, I'm, I'm talking with my, my director of the joint staff. It was probably last summer, but I can confirm that with Colonel Gates. Great. It, it'd be great to know. This is, that isn't just a guard all hazards plan. This is, um, involves, I think, the emergency management directors and stuff from the towns and from the regional planning commissions and stuff. Am I right? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. I, yeah. I thought it was specific to the National Guard. No, it is. It is a Vermont all hazards plan that involves um, local emergency management directors and um, regional planning people and um, <clears throat> It, it it is a pretty comprehensive, um, pretty comprehensive plan, and and the manual, if you want to look at it, is about this thick. Right, right. And who oversees that, Jeanette? A Vermont Emergency Management. So Erica. Mm -hmm. Erica, right? Okay. I I I'm, believe I'm right on that, right? I would yes, believe so. Hmm. I think I heard a yes. Great. Yes, ma'am. That's correct. Yeah. Great. Yeah. It it would be great at some point to 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 hear about how often it's reviewed and how effective it was and all that stuff. Well, I know that there were some pretty um, I'm pretty sure there were some pretty major drills down here last summer. I mean, some um, test drills and stuff. Great. So. Yes, ma'am. And we, we do those uh, routinely. And the big one, obviously, for us is, is the vigilant guard exercises. And those are actually done in, in all of the guard states, different tabletop exercises with their emergency management teams. Mm -hmm. Any more questions for the adjutant general? Anthony? I just I, I have a very basic question. General, when you talk about building the 400 bed um, site and whatnot. I'm presuming that's all 
there were like 400 beds were shipped up for, uh, using federal dollars from elsewhere? All state dollars. State dollars, okay. Because mm -hmm. I, I was just curious, because you know we heard, we heard all these problems with equipment being mm -hmm. not being lacking, and so you didn't have a problem with that when it came time to build something. It's just I'm glad to see the resources were there to make that happen. No, so the, yeah, the, re, the resources were were available. We understood the urgency and, and work with um, you know Mr. Gregg, the Deputy Adjutant General, who was really central to the success of getting things uh, funded and and work with uh, BGS. And I'll tell you, uh, hats off to those folks. The, uh, it's just a remarkable job streamlining the contracting process, uh, getting what normally is is a very detailed and task intensive thing that takes weeks sometimes, if not longer, and literally in some instances got it down to a matter of hours. Um, so they, they just did a remarkable job. And in the end, it, it'll be FEMA reimbursable. Um, I'm not sure the percentages. It might be 100%. I can confirm that. So uh, uh, this sounds like a silly question, but we had 400 beds lying around somewhere. <laughs> yeah, some of those beds were, were out of uh, existing uh, guard inventory, and then a number of them came from the uh, the uh, strategic national stockpile, the actual hospital beds that were designed to uh, have an IV bag uh, and all that stuff on it. Interesting. Thanks a lot for all you've done. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. So, any other questions, or Chris? Yeah, um, uh, I have a quick question on what's the fate of the uh, that special, you know, hospital? I guess we call it at the over at the fairgrounds. Are you is it going to stay ready because we don't really know what the future holds or what what's next for that? Well, right now we're we're uh, we finished up the plan and we're going to start breaking it down and retain a 50 bed surge capacity, 25 COVID positive, 25 non COVID uh, patients. And the, the structure itself, the, the framing and, and all the walls and all of the outlets and all of that stuff, we've uh, worked out a plan to actually store that here at Camp Johnson um, in its design. It's all four by eight construction, so it's very modular. So uh, all the parts will be labeled and will be stored in, in a somewhat humidity controlled um, warehouse here at Camp Johnson. So we'll be ready. Um, we'll already have the walls built, so we won't have to start from scratch. But if, if we get indications that there's gonna be a surge, we're, uh, we'll be able to, to stand it up pretty quickly. Right, but I mean, so you're saying it gets pared back down. Is there anything gonna, I don't know, a month from now, will there still be anything at the fairgrounds or it'll be all in storage? Well, we anticipate that that facility, at least the 50 beds, will be there through the end of June. Okay. And of and course, it's, you know, it'll be an iterative evaluation process. We'll have to keep looking at this with um, Dr. Levine, you know, the, the Department of Health and, and, um, and the governor's office. And if we've got indicators that, you know, there's going to be a spike um, down the road late summer or fall, then we'll be, uh, we'll be prepared to stand it back up again. And was your it was your team also right that set up the facility at UVM? Yes, sir. That's correct. And is UVM going to be mothballed, or is UVM going to sort of be in ready, just waiting? That that's a, a Department of Health decision. Um, I, I believe we've already pulled our folks out and are starting to break down that particular triage site. But again, that that's a, a pretty quick turn for us. Right. Uh, that was. Pretty straightforward. That's that's what those folks do. They establish those type of forward facilities. Okay. Well, I think it was uh, very reassuring to a lot of people <laughs> that to see how quickly you were able to put all that kind of resource together. Thankfully, we didn't need it really, but um, I think it was at a time when things were really kind of stunning for everyone. It was great to see that high level of function on your team. So thank you. Yep, here, here. Absolutely, sir. We're happy to be a part of it. Uh, and, and you're correct. I, I think all of us feel the same way that we're very happy that um, we, we haven't needed it. And hopefully it will stay that way. So I think look, our trend will continue. Um, that's what we're all hoping for. And this, um, your preparation for this or your response to this actually puts us in a much better position for any other, um, not only this this pandemic, but any other 
kind of crisis that um, I know that after when when we had all the training down here around Vermont Yankee and had and the Red Cross responded and we had more um, mobile Red Cross units and uh, stuff, we were better prepared to deal with Irene than we would have been otherwise. So we unfortunately we um, each each crisis puts us in a better position for the next one. That's unfortunate, but that is the way it is. Yes, ma'am. And, and you had mentioned the Red Cross. That's and I, I would be remiss to, to not bring it up. That's something else that that our uh, our soldiers uh, did. I believe we did six blood drives because as this thing started to develop, the Red Cross um, had mm -hmm. numerous cancellations on the sites for their blood drives. And um, our folks stepped up and opened the armories. And again, Mr. Gregg uh, was, did a great job facilitating that. So uh, in each instance, uh, the Red Cross showed up with, with their uh, the volunteers and they ran out of bags. Uh, the the oh. level of, of donation was, was so high. So we're, we're looking Thank at, um, we get on the backside of eight weeks and we'll do it again. Thank you. Any more questions? All set. All right. Well, we just we really want to thank you both for being here today, but for also for all that you did and and your fast response and keeping people assured that um, you are out there working for us. So I, I think that that we really need we owe you a a debt of gratitude. So thank you. Honor us, it's an honor for us to do it, ma'am. I, I appreciate what you do for us. So Pat, please pass that on from us to your members. Here, here. I will do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for right. your Thank time you, today. Absolutely. Stay safe. Yes, you too. Thank you. All right, committee, we're going to, um, I see we have Representative Harrison here with us. Hmm. Hello. So, um, would you like to talk to us about um, anything in particular, or should we just start questioning you? Or would you like to talk about the Weathersfield Charter? Um, first of all, I'm having a little internet problem today, so if um, you can't hear me okay, let me know and I'll call back. We will. So, okay. Um, so I just, an update on charters. Uh, we passed one over earlier in the session to you, Perkinsville. It's pretty yes. straightforward. Um, the, town of the town of Weathersfield includes the village of Perkinsville and that's bill um, H554. Uh, Anne Marie Christensen, Representative Christensen can certainly give you the background. She happens to be president of the Board of Trustees for the village of Perkinsville. And they were formed some many, many years ago to uh, basically pay the light bill for the little section in the village. Um, it's getting harder and harder to get everyone together. So they approached the select board because they're in part of the town of Weathersfield and asked if they would, if they were to dissolve, would that be okay with the select board? So the select board said, yes, they reached an agreement. Uh, they had a, a little bit of money and I accent little, which the village wanted to uh, give to the uh, old school um, that is being preserved in the village. And they wanted an agreement to continue the, the lights in that little section would be continued to be paid for. Uh, the select board agreed to that. And this merger um, or dis dissolution of the village of Perkinsville um, basically puts that all in and it's been agreed to by all parties, um, the select board unanimously, and, as well as the voters in the village itself. Um, believe it passed the house unanimous. I know it passed the, our committee unanimously. So it's pretty straightforward and um, happy to answer any questions on that. Um, beyond that, uh, if you so have just a minute, I'll just update if... you on some other topics. 
to sure. let's see first if there are any questions on that one. Allison. So Jim, it's good to see you. My understanding from uh, Anne Marie, because I spoke with her in preparation for this discussion, um, there are only 72 residents in the uh, village of Perkinsville. And my understanding is um, that uh, that they that, that either the that it's Perkinsville that has the charter, not the town of Weathersfield. Is that right? That's correct. If Perkinsville dissolves, I mean they're all members of the town anyhow. So the but village the, is within the town. Right, but it's the village so, that had the charter, not the town. That's correct. That's right. correct. Which is unusual. I, I mentioned it only because that's mm -hmm. unusual. And what was yes. also unusual about this is that this is about the streetlights. The streetlights were actually evidently put in and owned by a legislator initially. Oh, I didn't I realize that. Who. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, anyway, it's, it's, which is pretty interesting. Thanks. What I didn't ask is, pre-1965, if they were able to have a legislator for both the village and the town. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't dig that up, so. <laughs> um, I believe they only got town because all of us only uh, got town. Those still have villages. But okay. uh, my understanding is this is a matter of $3,000. It's pretty modest. And so the town was happy to absorb it. Right. All, all right. So. Um, do we want to um, vote on this this um, charter? Well, actually, um, I'm not sure we can. We weren't given permission to actually vote today, so we'll hold off and vote um, on Friday, unless there's any concerns. None here. No. Okay, so. So Jim, do you want to, did you have other things, other charters that you wanted to talk to us sure. about? So there is one charter that's been on the house calendar uh, since before we left um, the house chamber back in March. It has to do with the Brattleboro charter, H535, um, that allows 16 year olds to vote on local elections. Um, that was deemed a little controversial. I don't know what status of that is going forward, uh, but it is on the house calendar. It has been since March 13th. Um, in our committee, we had half a dozen or five, five or six new charters since town meeting that have been introduced over the past couple weeks. Some of them in all likelihood, we're not going to get to um, because they're gonna require a fair amount of testimony. Uh, they have provisions that are a little bit out of the ordinary. Um, for example, one has a provision in there that allows them to pick and choose any town charter provision that's been passed or authorized in any other town. So um, would require a lot of testimony and understanding of what um, some of the towns want to do. And our chair has indicated we not have the time or bandwidth to take a lot of testimony. There are two uh, that local option taxes. And in all likelihood, because that's pretty simple, it's just enabling. Um, we will probably advance those. They will have to go to the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, one is H946 Elmore, uh, which wants a local rooms tax. Um, I assume for Airbnbs because they, last I looked, they don't have any hotels uh, in that town. Um, and the other is H943, uh, St. Albans would like to have the ability to do a local option tax. Um, so those two, I think, are pretty straightforward. We don't need to do much testimony. Um, and I suspect we'll move them on. And those decisions will be made by ways and means. But uh, whether they make it through in time, 
still remains to be seen, but um, those are too likely to be coming up. We have one for Essex, which we talked about before. Um, that would require quite a bit of um, testimony. Uh, that's H944. I'm not sure if there's a will to devote a lot of time to that. There are different people in town that have indicated they would like to testify. Um, the legislators representing Essex and Essex Junction have varied opinions. Um, so, um, and again, they're hoping to put together a plan for merger in November. So it begs the question, what's the rush? Um, if you're gonna change it in November anyhow. Um, Williston has several unique um, suggestions. Again, a lot of testimony, so I'm not sure we're gonna get there. They have a provision on uh, labor relations law that's evidently different than any other municipal labor relations law. Um, so uh, again, that would take quite a bit of um, testimony to understand that provision, uh, so it may not make it. And then uh, the last one is Burlington, H942. We just received that, well, yesterday or no, whenever we, whenever we last met, I guess we received that. Um, we have not taken any testimony on that one. Um, I don't, I think it's pretty straightforward, but again, it's just a matter of time to, to deal with it. So I think that's all we have in the pipeline. Um, we had one earlier in the session, Fairhaven, H678. It's a local option tax. However, the voters voted it down at town meeting. Um, Fairhaven submitted a charter request before they bothered to ask the voters um, <laughs> to uh, actually adopt the charter. Uh, so we were going to wait and see how the vote and the voters turned it down. So um, we have not done anything with that bill. <laughs> so that's, I think that's okay. all we have that I can see so far, unless Tucker knows of something else. No. So any questions for Representative Harrison? No. Well, well, but not, I mean, about charters. I'm just, yes. So, um, <laughs> I think that what we'll do is, um, I think there's no issue with the Weathersfield Perkinsville charter. And um, we'll just wait and see if these other ones actually get to us or not. Sure. And so the, um, the way we're going to be doing um, non COVID related bills is that we will be they will take the same process that they usually take. So there won't be, we won't be advancing them into all stages of passage, like we are the COVID bills. We heard that this morning on the floor. So um, people should know that if, if, a char if this charter comes up for a floor vote, it'll come up and then it'll follow the, the regular procedure. So, any other questions? Great. Well, thank you very much. Any other thank questions? You. Thank you. All right. Thank so, you, I'll Jim. go down and join my house colleagues. All right. Okay. All. Oh, are you on the floor? No, in committee. No, no oh, in, we're in, um, we're in a uh, house gov ops committee. We're, right. we're doing, we're looking at the nurse compact. Oh, right. good. Okay. Well, thank okay. you for joining us. Enjoy You're having welcome. Betsy Thank Ann you. with you. Oh, that's right. She said she was going there. Okay. Goodbye, right. so, so, um, Any other questions or anything? Um, Brian, you're going to get out of here by three. Yeah, that's great. In fact, I'll you're going to get say, out a little bit. Huh? Um, I would like Allison actually to report that last charter because I think it's in your district and you seem to have so much interest in it. I'd be happy to once we get to vote it. I'm sure we will. Okay. And my job, my job between now and then is finding out which legislator owned and then tried to increase the rates on the streetlights. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty <really> fascinating. <laughs> that's unique. 
I know, amazing. And you should tell that story on the floor. As long as you don't make fun of me. I don't. Okay. We will. I won't. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet, exactly. <laughs> Okay, anything else, committee, that we need to do today? We're going to look at um, law enforcement issues on Friday. And what I'm going to do is actually at the chair, at the rules committee this morning, um, we're going to have uh, permission to get 233 and 220 out of finance. Right. And um, I'm going to have Betsy walk us through 124 of what's left. She did that nice um, piece for us on law enforcement and she'll send it out again because there are some things in there around the training council and the academy and stuff that I think we want to want to promote and um, so we'll there if if it's in appropriations now and the way they'll do it I think is to have an amendment to pull out the parts that we've already passed in the in the initial bill that we did around EMS so that it doesn't get confusing um and then so those are the that's what we're going to do on friday any other uh, yeah I, I just wanted to bring up the so brian and i were on the lessons learned uh call and anthony was on it because of transitions oh no it was just brian and me this morning we had a lessons learned and our objective is to try and get all the lessons learned, if we can, just the high level lessons learned from each committee by the end of this week. And, and we're asking committees, we're going to your suggestion to that and asking each committee to do the first dive on it, but fairly high level at this point um, before we get into the uh, possible changes, but the sort of high level initial lessons learned while they're fresh in our mind is the whole point. So, so is this, lessons learned so because i think of this as three things not two the first is how do we transition right to a non-crisis mode the second is what what did we learn that we need to be make sure is in position for the next when the next wave hits or if it does so that we're not scrambling again and then the third is what did we learn that can become permanent? So I'm not sure which lessons learned you guys are dealing with. Uh, uh, I think all uh, uh, we're not dealing with the transitions. That's Brian. no, no, no. But which lessons uh, learned? I think both that... those, both of those, I think are, would be part of our lessons learned. And I'm keeping. I'm. I'm going to type up what we've got so far from our discussions yesterday and today. Um, and and our hope is, you know, to move this along because this is just chapter one of lessons learned. And I think chapter two of lessons learned and it goes to your point is what what have we learned that we actually want to make permanent? I mean, what do we what have we learned that we want to really change? So that I think that's part of second uh, of chapter two. But it's you know, this is a it's fluid. I would say anything at all that that's pretty high level at this point is is game. Is that I fair, think, Brian? Yeah. Yeah. Because I think there are lessons learned that that we need to be able to make sure that we have in place for, if we have another um, yeah. kind of crisis situation in the fall that may not be permanent. Like I would like us to make sure that we have this um, issue around open meetings that they don't have to have a physical location so that we don't have to right. deal with that again if there's this. But that isn't a permanent change. That's just, um, or in my opinion, that's not a permanent change. Right, that's through the crisis. That's through this pandemic crisis. Well, or what if he in, um, we're talking about COVID-19 and that's the way all the bills have been written. Right, right. So if, if the emergency is declared over on June 3rd, and then in September 3rd, it's, declared an emergency again, the things from COVID-19 will not kick in because that's a different emergency. So we- It's I still think, the same disease. It's still the same emergency. I don't it's the think same it disease. is. It yeah. says till the end of the declared emergency of COVID-19. 
Right, but that's that, what it, all research, our bills say. I, I get it, but a resurgence will still be of COVID-19. So it will, well, we, they will probably have to enact, you know, it'll probably have to be a, another executive order, but it will still, it, we, it can get booted back into action uh, the minute there's further action by the governor. I think we need to make, be clear about that, that if, if the emergency is declared over, and then there's an, another emergency declaration. What I think we need to do is we need to make sure that all of those things that ended at the end of the emergency declaration of COVID-19 will be able to kick in again. And that might take additional legislation because, so I think we need to make sure that that, how that will work, Brian? Yeah, I thought um, actually Senator Perchlick had a pretty good idea this morning on in, in this regard. Um, he talked about having an omnibus bill that took into account, for instance, from the uh, agency or from the uh, Committee on Transportation, the license renewal, the inspection of vehicles, all that kind of stuff. So they would have one section of it. Government operations would have a separate section of it with all the flexibility allowances that we gave municipalities. The health and welfare committee would have theirs in there with deadlines that were extended, extended and all that. So we'd have this huge bill that we could in, just call up once, pass it, and the whole thing would be just like it is now. And I, I thought that was a pretty good idea. I think it is a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it would basically be the same things that we've done now. We wouldn't have to talk about them again. They would just go back into effect. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think that it's going to take a piece of legislation to do that because I don't think they're going to automatically go back in if there's a I new, agree. A new um, declaration of emergency. Yeah. Okay. Dale had a question about, um, let me open the chat up. You had mentioned three bills for Friday, Madam Chair. S-124, S-233, and was the other one? Um, no, no, 233 and 240. 220 we're not dealing with on Friday. They're in finance. We're done with them. Oh, okay. 220 was the other one, Gail. What? Yeah. 220, 124 is the only one. Right. But we're only talking specifically about S124. Yeah, we're done with 220 and 233. Okay. Yeah. We don't have to do them again. Brian is all set to report 233, and I can report 220, and there you have it. Thank you, Senator Collimore. Okay. You're welcome. All right. Anything else? No. Nope. We'll see you in the nope. all Senate call tomorrow. Oh, when is that? How do we know that? It's well, at noon gonna... tomorrow. My, it's my break tomorrow. Okay. Can't... All right. See you then. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Gail. Bye.